Um, so without further ado, I'm going to take you through uh, the Silk Roads of, of Central Asia, a presentation by Yellowwood Adventures. I think I do feel like I've almost bitten off more than I can chew for, for a subject of such scale and magnitude. We're a British adventure travel company. Uh, we've been operating for seven years. Um, I started the company in, in Ethiopia and Africa, but Kyrgyzstan was the second country we opened in. Iran was the third. We're now in about 20 countries, encompassing mainly Central Asia and Africa. Um, and so I just thought this would be sort of a good taster session to just give you an idea of the region. And we, we use the Silk Roads as, as an overall theme. So what are the Silk Roads? The Silk Roads date back to, and, and here's a medieval image of a, of a caravan taking goods um, along the roads. The, the, the Silk Roads date back to the 12th century and to this gentleman here, who most of you will recognize as Chinggis Khan, uh, the ruler of Mongolia. So he managed to unite the Mongol tribes and then just, just took off like a lightning bolt across Central Asia and, you know, at, at the sword with his Mongol warriors on horseback. You can see Mongolia situated here. And then eventually the, you know, the, the great empire of, of, of the Mongols um, stretched all the way to, to Europe and, and the Danube in, in, in modern times. And this was really the catalyst for what then created the Silk Roads. Because before then, you know, there were history is so long and so complex there were local warring tribes or a small per empires was rise and fall you literally couldn't access this region it was it was too dangerous uh if you tried to take goods even when the silk road was up and running it was still a dangerous uh undertaking um by 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 any stretch of the imagination but what the mongols did was yes they conquered um, the region, you know, they caused great destruction and, and death, but then they actually managed to so solidify the region. They were fantastic administrators. They were able to bring order and a relative amount of, of, of settlement to the region so that trade and movement between these previously separated cultures um, could, could start. And, and, and from then, the, the Silk Roads were really born. Um, the way it evolved later was that the Mongol Empire died down relatively quickly. The, the Chinese, it was the Chinese who had developed silk. So they built the Great Wall of China, as you know, to try and then keep the Mongols out. So the main trade routes actually came from uh, China, bringing silk and many other goods. And with that got, got carried in you know, religion and languages and ideas and science and mathematics. Um, but um, then it was really from this this uh, the, the, this east to west pass that, that the Silk Roads have their name. And there are so many different routes for the Silk Roads. We're just going to focus on some countries that we operate in and I have experience of and to just give you a flavor for, for the countries and, and, and obviously you could be interested to then visit them. I love to read. Reading for me has opened up the world before I was able to personally travel. And still to this day, I love books because it gives me new ideas and it's so you get much more into the under the skin of a country. The first book I'd like to recommend on this subject is, is by Tim Cope. He actually followed the original route of, of the Mongolians and Genghis Khan on horseback. It took him over two years. He's Australian. And he did this in, in, um, uh, in the 2000s. And it's just a really incredible book. You learn so much about the countries we're going to, to, to look at. But we're going to start with Mongolia, which is, is where it all started. So Mongolia is kind of the last great frontier of, of the world, I would say. It's, you know, it's it's an enormous country. It's a good size of about, you know, Western Europe, and yet it has a population of just over 5 million, most of whom are based in Ulaanbaatar. So once you get out of the, the, the his picture of me in a silly hat on a small horse, uh, the first time I ever went to Mongolia, I've been four times now. And then once you get out of the, um, City Ulaanbaatar, which means Red Warrior, was overtaken by the, by the Soviets. Um, you you just have space. You have you know it's uh, horseback riding is obviously one of the best ways to, to to view the countryside, but you just 
really get back to sort of how life was hundreds and, and thousands of years ago. The Mongolians are still traditional nomadic pastoralists. And that, that means they nomadic means you move from place to place. And that word's going to crock up a lot over this presentation, looking at Central Asia, which is where the nomadic lifestyle originates. But why were they nomads? They're nomadic because they live by their flocks. So uh, cattle, camels, horses, obviously, sheep, goats, the, the the Central Asian weather systems are very extreme, the freezing winters, boiling uh, summers, and you have to move your animals around so they can they can survive because you only survive because of your animals. And that's why the Mongols, you know, live in girs um, and 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 live off their animals. The girls are the, are the felt tents you can see here because they would only stay in one place for a couple of months. Um, and then once the animals have obviously, you know, grazed their fill or the weather, come, bad weather comes in, they'll they'll move them along. Um, the, 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 this is one of our guides called Basca. You can see she's wearing a Mongolian deal, it's called. Beautiful, um, traditional clothing, but actually very warm. And you'll see they're very long. Um, and that's actually really good for keeping your legs warm when you're riding, because obviously you get high winds on, on the Mongolian step. Um, we just absolutely love going riding through Mongolia. I was there again towards the end of last year with a group. Um, you just, you know, you just, you're out in the big sky country. We stay with local nomadic peoples. Here's a very cute picture of a young baby we, in, in, in one of the Gur camps we were staying with. They're just such lovely people. Their they're warm personality comes through. And it's just kind of a getting back to nature, getting back to basics, getting back to life as it as it as it was for hundreds and thousands of years for humans. And all the horses you ride are sort of semi-nomadic because after they've ridden one, they'll just take off the saddle and let it go off and 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 ride around with its family and friends. And then when you want to ride a horse, you'll just ride off and 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 go and capture your horse again. Another thing we love doing in Mongolia is, is flying over from Alambatar to the west to Ulgi, um, where the Kazakh population who, who emigrated over the border from Kazakhstan into the western Mongolia, and they brought them a with them a tradition of eagle hunting. Um, this is a, a race that they do in a festival called Kiss the Girl. Uh, uh, a man will try and race, and, and if he can kiss the girl on the cheek on the galloping horses, he'll win her. Um, but what they love to do is, is take the, the eagles out on horseback and, and use them to hunt marmots or rabbits or, or small animals. They just they just love it. And it's it's a great um, piece of culture. We go we've got groups going every year in September to, to, to see the Eagle Festival. Um, and this is a, a, a famous gentleman here. He's the world champion uh, horse rider in Mongolia, and he actually competes at the World Nomad Games, which are held every two years in Central Asia. Uh, more on that to come in Kazakhstan. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just going to whip through. We've got loads of countries to, to look at. I'm just trying to give you a, a flavor of some of these. But from um, Mongolia, I've, I've mentioned China, we're going to sort of move down and and look at the, the, the Silk Road in, we can't do all the countries, but in a selection. And I wanted to pick Bhutan because it's an absolutely stunning country that's hidden away. It's never been invaded. It's in the foothills of, of the Himalayas. The, the, the One of the su more southerly Silk Roads would absolutely pass through this region. And um, for 60 or 70 years, the, the trail of that Silk Road that goes through Bhutan had been closed because people opened highways and toll gates and, and it just got lost. But in the last couple of years, that's been reopened. Um, and it's known as the, the Trans-Bhutan Trail. Um, and it's uh, it's we it takes uh, probably about a month to hike uh, end to end of Bhutan. Um, through the different regions here, but you know the the the, the well the monarchy of of Bhutan it's it's you know still still has a king. They decided to reopen this and do a big uh, push for tourism, and um, we have a, a tour that that allows you to do like five or six days of of hiking along along the trail. Obviously, then seeing the the jewel in the crown, which is called the 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 tiger's nest, which is nestled into mountains, and Bhutan is been really smart in many ways because 
unlike um, neighboring Nepal, which is fantastic, and I've been to several times to go walking in the Himalayas, they've, they've understood that tourism needs to be regulated. Um, because, um, you know, tourism has been fantastic to Nepal, but it's hit that tipping point now. You know, Everest Base Camp um, is is overrun, essentially, and Kathmandu is is sort of sagging under the weight of, of un, unregulated tourism in, in many ways with pollution issues and so on. Bhutan have, have always tried to uh, sort of hold tourism in at a respectable distance but then also combine it with with sustainable tourism practices so there is a tourism tax to enter bhutan it's a hundred dollars per person per day and that hundred dollars so if you went for nine days that would be nine hundred dollars goes to the government of bhutan which they then put back into sustainable tourism practices back into the local communities such as getting this trans bhutan trail back off the ground and that obviously goes into a lot of the local communities that are based along the way. Um, they kind of got a bit overzealous with this tax and put it up to $200 per day last year. Tourism, as a result, quite understandably, kind of fell off a cliff uh, with that. And so the, the Tourism Board of Bhutan, you know, um, with great humility and, and wisdom said, OK, that's a bit much and, and put it back to, to $100 a day. And it's just we 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 run tours here. It's... Um, it's just one of these sort of mysterious kingdoms. Again, like Mongolia, it captures so much of, of ancient times because it's been it's never been invaded, as I mentioned. It's it's just kept its own culture. Buddhism, obviously, as you, as you saw from the map with the with the proximity to Tibet, has has flourished here over hundreds of, of, of years. And so it's a um it's a real center for wellness. It ranks extremely highly on the happiness index, as, as I'm sure many of you will have heard. But, you know, it's it's slow uh, way of life. It's it's poor in, in many places in the countryside, but it just has this spiritual quality, is I think the word I'm, I'm searching for, um, that I would highly recommend. And it's, you know, it's not one of the cheaper destinations to go and see, but you really get what you pay for with Bhutan. It's completely unique. There is nowhere quite like it in the world. So I'd highly recommend that. I've peppered this uh, this presentation with um, with with books that I'd recommend. I'm I'm very aware that I'm probably butchering a lot of historical references or missing out so much that I'd plan to include. But you know, if I've if I've done anything, uh, I would like to give you a, 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 you know, some inspiration to see these countries, but then also to just learn more about Central Asia because the history is so rich and so fascinating. And and Peter Frankopan, he's a professor he uh, at Oxford. He brought this out, um, and it and it created quite a stir in 2016. It's a it's it's a hypnotic book, and it really brings out the. Understand it because living in the West, you know, we consider ancient history. We think of the Greeks and the Romans, and and that was it. But you, he, you know, brings the Persian Empire and how connected they were with the Greeks, and then with the Silk Road, so how much of our cultural heritage and influences is uh, shared from from the East, um, the Orient, you know, the mysterious place that, that many Westerners don't fully understand or or have read about. And um, he's just brought out a new book, actually, called The New History of the Silk Road, I think, which I haven't read yet, but um, that's that's actually next onto my list. So moving across into these two, what I'd like to say, more sort of spiritual, religious focus areas um, of, of this section of the Silk Road will come through Bhutan. I mentioned Nepal, but if you can see up in the top here, um, it's a part of India called Ladakh, uh, but it's also known as as Little Tibet. Um, I've always been so interested in in Jammu and Kashmir, um, but unfortunately, due to the proximity to to, to Pakistan, um, it's always quite difficult to to visit. the The British government, the FCDO, the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. You know, it's constantly going onto the red list. There's always scuffles breaking out between. Uh, um, the Indian and, and Pakistani governments, whereas Ladakh up here is um, is India proper. It's not disputed territory. It remains stable. It's safe uh, and absolutely stunning uh, to visit because the reason it's called Little Tibet is 
is because when China invaded Tibet, um, it was, you know, very, very quick occupation, and many Tibetans fled over the border, including the Dalai Lama at a later date, into northern India. And Ladakh is the region where many, many Tibetans settled and have rebuilt their cultural heritage. Many of the traditional Tibetan Buddhist monasteries and temples have been built there. Here's a, here's a picture from one of our groups in last year. And there's, it's a huge center for spiritual Buddhist learning. Um, and it's just absolute, it's, it feels like Tibet in, in many ways, because you just have these long, long valleys, these incredible stupas, um, and, um, you know, Tibetan cultural influence. Obviously, it's still India, so you have a mix be be between all of those. But these just long mountainous um, views, and it's just um, every every client that goes there is always completely wowed by it. Um, I would still like to open tours in in Kashmir in the future because you've got the Great Lakes and and the houseboats there. Um, but in the meantime, more than happy to um, Hello. continue pr promoting Ladakh. Yeah. Uh, sorry, could I just ask everyone to keep on on mute? Um, I'm thinking about it. Why? Okay. Oh, there's someone in the waiting room. I'll just let you in. You bought one recently. We have a... Um... Okay. I've just put everyone on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so going back to what I was saying, and yeah, you can see here, this will look very... These 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 um, orange hats and, and robes, it's it's you would look at I, most people would look at that and say that's a picture from from Tibet, but it's actually Ladakh in in northern India. So um, it's absolutely uh, top 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 of the list. I would I'd really really recommend it. It's it's becoming more and more popular for us uh, as a business. And so I mentioned the um, the the sort of tension point uh, a bit lower down between India and Pakistan, and and Ladakh was uh, a very um, uh, prominent featured uh, region of the Silk Roads, of, of the caravanserais and, and trade that was going through. And then obviously through Ladakh, you would come into Pakistan. And so this uh, brings me on to a period of history that's very close to my heart and one of my personal favourites. It's known as the Great Game. Um, and this harkens back to the British Empire when India was under uh, British rule, the British Raj, uh, hadn't been separated from Pakistan, um, and the Soviets, the Tsarist, so, um, um, sorry, um, Tsarist Russia, wanted wanted the wealth of, of of British India, and so that sort of that region in between in Afghanistan, in um, you'll see much of Uzbekistan, um, and and modern day Pakistan became a sort of no man's land for espionage between the British agents and, and the Russian agents, always looking for, you know, passes where, where the enemies could go through to, to invade. And Peter Hopkirk, um, the, he, the, the great game was actually coined by Rudyard Kipling, the poet uh, from famous poet who wrote the jungle book from, from the British empire um, in, in his book, Kim, um, which uh, the protagonist takes on, you know, the role of, of, of dressing up in different cultures and espionage and the spy network that was going through Central Asia then. And this book, unlike no other one, brings it to life. This is a photo of, of Mahatma Gandhi and with the British. Um, when, um, when India came to independence in 1947, um, the, they then split with, with Pakistan, uh, as you will know, which is predominantly Muslim compared to the predominantly Hindu India. Um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was influent, uh, well, he caused that to happen and then was unfortunately assassinated in January of 1948 um, by a Hindu nationalist. And that brings us on to, to modern day Pakistan. So it's so hard to, um, to to run through these countries and 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 try and do them justice, as as I've mentioned, um, because Pakistan has just got so much. There is it's such a large country. It's such a melting pot of cultures. Um, if you look at the the Hunza Valley, for example, 
Um, it's nestled deep in the Karakoram mountains of Pakistan. It's, you know, for hiking, it's a hiker's paradise. You've got five peaks all above 7,000 meters. Um, as Eric Shipton uh, once quoted, it's the ultimate manifestation of, of mountain grandeur. And it it truly is. I mean, the photos just, just do not do it justice. Ap apologies if they're a little bit blurry on, on this screen uh, here. And then within that, you you know in the Hunza Valley alone you have four distinct cultures with different languages um their lifespans are extremely long because again they just harken back to an age you know they have mobile phones but it's so much less touched by modern civilization their diet is so much healthier based on locally grown fruit nuts barley dairy products um and and we do trips hiking through through these um these areas and it is just it's just absolutely fantastic we've got a confirmed departure again in june this year and then other ones later in the year um pakistan is 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 completely something else i would say that we obviously follow well we have safety management system that's th three pronged we follow our own common sense and we follow the local advice of our partners on the ground and the advice of the FCDO British government, and and in that triangle, um, is is you know where we will make decisions to change routes, cancel trips. We ran trips in Lebanon until October last year, where due to the proximity to Israel, we 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 thought it was uh, too unsafe to to continue tours there. Pakistan, you have to be a bit careful where you're going, especially with the border to Afghanistan. Um, but you know, safety is always remains the, the 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 principal point of of all of our trips. That being said, when when you look at some of the views you can see here, um, it's just it's 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 worth it as long as it can be done in in a safe way, which it can be done uh, at the moment. So the the very colourful headdress here you'll see it's this is from one of the tribes uh, that comes along when you get to um, the Chitra Valley. So. And this is within the Hindu Kush. Hindu Kush actually means the end of the Hindu kingdom um, because they were never able to perme permeate these, these, this huge corridor of, of, of mountains. Um, and Buddhist pilgrims uh, in the second century would walk from Tibet through the Swat Valley um, where Tibetan Buddhism originates. And, you know, this was part of the Silk Road and, and but very not just focused um, on trade, but on on religion as well as as I've mentioned, and time really has stood still here um, a lot. There's a beautiful polo is extremely popular. We're going to talk about nomadic polo um, about in the World Nomad Games in Kazakhstan. But modern day polo with a stick and a ball originated in northern India and Pakistan during the British Raj, where the the British observed the local nomadic polo, which is actually played with a decapitated goat uh, carcass um, and they had some hockey sticks lying around and um, you know had a cricket ball somewhere and modern day polo was born and and it's still you know played to to this day in the region um, and then I just want to um, if there's something else I've forgotten about Pakistan I'll I'll, I'll mention and come back to you apologies um, and then moving up through through India, Pakistan, we get into more the the the, the traditional stands of of what people think of when they think of of Central Asia. Um, a fantastic book is actually written by the wife of Peter Hopkirk, who wrote the Great Game, uh, Kathleen Hopkirk. She's taken, um, you know, Marco Polo, Fitzroy MacLean, who I mention uh, later. Alexander Burns, who was a famous uh, protagonist in in a lot of the espionage in the Great Game, and she's intertwined it with with um, sections of their travel writing, and um, that's that's a really good book if you want to get your teeth into the region. So Kyrgyzstan, as I mentioned, was the second place Yellowwood Adventures started operating seven years ago. Um, it's a tiny little country, but it really packs uh, a good punch. Uh, the capital in, in Bishkek is a uh, really surprisingly beautiful city. Um, the, these were all, this was all a sort of Soviet satellite um, regions. The Soviets found huge um, white marble deposits and built beautiful um, 
buildings in in Bishkek, uh, and it's a very leafy, sleepy uh, city. Um, but the history is really interesting of Kyrgyzstan. This uh, photo uh, of a man on a horse is Manus, uh, and he um, famously brought together the 40 tribes of Kyrgyzstan. He united them, much as Chinggis Khan did with the Mongols. He united the small, you know, nomadic tribes in, in Kyrgyzstan to then build a country to be able to fight against Chinese, Mongol, whoever, invaders. And um, you can see the, the flag of Kyrgyzstan is uh, the red flag with a yellow sun with 40 rays, which represents all of those 40 tribes. And uh, the middle of that, that, that symbol shows the uh, center of, they don't call them Gers in um, Kyrgyzstan, they call them Yurts, but it's actually a very similar design, the felt tents of the nomads. But these funny hats the men are wearing are called Kalpaks. And by the design embroidered on the Kalpaks and the different styles, you can tell which uh, of the original 40 tribes this Kyrgyz nomad are, are originated from. So one of our tours uh, takes in some of the Great Lakes. Issacal Lake, uh, second largest alpine lake in the world after Lake Titicaca. Absolutely stunning. Some parts you can barely see the other side. It's like the Med, but you have the, the snowy cat Tian Shan Mountains in the background. Again, they are very strong in preserving their traditional nomadic heritage, eagle hunting, archery, wrestling. Um, and this is a, this was actually uh, rebuilt by the Soviets, but this was a very famous caravanserai on the Silk Road called Tashrabat. Um, and uh, a caravanserai is a sort of, it's an inn essentially. So imagine, you know, you're there with your camels laden with spices or rolls of silk or gemstones or whatever you're trading. Um, you've just crossed deserts. You've just outrun bandits. You, you get to a caravanserai. It's a place of safety where you can bring in your animals, your camels, your horses. You can tie them up. You can communicate, sit around fires, talk about um, you know, your journey uh, in a multitude of languages. There would have been musicians. Um, and inside, it's actually huge. The mountain's taken over a lot of it. But it's so fascinating to go into these places and imagine what it what it was like as, as a trade route. Um, and then uh, Kyrgyzstan, you know, we always stay in, in yurts. There's, once you're out, again, in uh, away from the cities, very limited infrastructure, which is just how I like it. And you can stay in beautiful yurts uh, on the some of the Great Lakes. Um, and then the Tian Shan Mountains, again, fantastic for, for, for hiking. Uh, we've been doing loads of hikes there for, for, for years. It's um, We do it all by horsepower. So all of the uh, food, the um, tents, I've got 12 British tents out there. Uh, all of the equipment will be carried by horses. We'll go up over a pass into a green valley, camp, uh, look at glaciers, gallop around like idiots, uh, pack everything up the next day and, and do it all again. Um, really, really just, just again, just untouched. The, it's what you go to Central Asia for. It's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And from little Kyrgyzstan, which you can see here, you've got Kazakhstan, which is absolutely massive. Um, um, you know, in wasn't always Kazakhstan in history. It's been part of Russia. It's been part of various different empires, um, but still uh, retains a, a strong nomadic heritage. And this year uh, in September, it's where the World Nomad Games are going to be held. Uh, so I attended the World Nomad Games in 2018 with a group of a large group of clients, um, and that was held in Kyrgyzstan two years ago. This event was held in uh, Turkey. Uh, so Turkey has, um, they're trying to sort of rebuild the Ottoman Empire in, in some ways. They um, spend a lot of money in, in Central Asia, you know, promoting Islam. Uh, they, they, they built an almost exact replica of the Hagia Sophia Mosque in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, for example. Um, and so Erdogan, when he saw the 2018 games, he said, oh, I want to do that. The pandemic got in the way. Then it was in Turkey, but now it's coming back um, and it's going to be in Kazakhstan in the city of Astana. And the nomadic games, it's it's like Olympics for Central Asian nomads. You've got horse racing, wrestling, archery, um, yurt building, 
uh, crafts, music. It's just like going to sort of like a medieval festival. Uh, it's so exciting to watch. Um, these, this is uh, the Kazakh uh, Buzkashi team. So Buzkashi is the word for nomadic polo, uh, which isn't with a stick and ball, as I mentioned. It's essentially rugby on horseback. You're wrestling a decapitated goat carcass from the other team, galloping for your life while they're ramming into you or punching you in the face, and you have to put in, in into a hole uh, at the end of the other field. Um, extremely fun to watch, very exhilarating. Um, and, and these are a few snaps from uh, when we attended in 2018. Now it's held in Astana, which is a relatively modern city in Kazakhstan, in stadiums and in different places in the city. So it'll be a little bit of a different vibe, um, but we're, we're just going to watch the opening ceremony and then two days of the games, which is enough in my experience. And then we're going to do a tour of Kazakhstan to go out and see the natural beauty of which it has plenty, uh, such as the, the Charin, uh, Karin, uh, Canyon, excuse me, here. Um, all of this is, all of these tours and information uh, uh, is on our website, by the way. So, Going up into Kazakhstan, we're, we're going to dip back down into Uzbekistan. Uh, the final book um, that I'll recommend, it's a terrible front cover, by the way, and also the title explains nothing about what it's doing. Um, but Fitzroy McLean, uh, back in the 50s, was an avid uh, historian and a great traveller himself, and he loved these stories of espionage and heroism from both sides, the British and the Russian and, and locals caught up in, in what was the great game. And he's tried to, well, he has very successfully captured a lot of those um, in this book. Uh, he talks about, um, there's one very, you know, upsetting uh, and story of, of, of two British um, uh, soldiers called uh, Stoddart and Connolly who were captured by the Emir of Bokhara and, and kept in prison for, for months and months in, in terrible conditions and tortured un, until they were beheaded in, in the square. And, you know, there's it's it's just a very, very interesting um, uh, period of history. So, and then Uzbekistan, you really go for for the cities and, and the architecture. The culture is fantastic. The plov is delicious, the food, the dancing. Um, but what you have there are this section of the Silk Road where the wealth was really concentrated and focused uh, on the architecture. And the main uh, historical centers are Samarkand, Bukhara and, and Kiva. And um, we run a cultural tour of, of, of Uzbekistan starting in Tashkent, but 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 taking in these these cultural highlights. Um, and yeah, it's just, you know, history is so full of wars and 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 Bokhara and Kiva, as beautiful as they are today, they were notorious slaving cities, you know. The um, nomads would would ride up into Russia and ransack towns and there were many, many uh, hundreds of Russian slaves um, in in these cities for for, for years and years. Uh, this Re Registan Square in in Samarkand. So Samarkand is um, the created by um, Tamerlane, also known as 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 Timur, um, and it's just he was <laughs> he was a. a well, probably not, but known as a descendant of, of Cengiz Khan. He was sort of half um, Turkish, half um, nomadic Kazakh. Uh, and Tamerlane, as you know, made Genghis Khan look like a, a pussycat. He was one of the most awful invaders and, and cruel uh, dictators in history. And through his incessant wars um, the and, and military campaigns, uh, he always would send the best artists and craftsmen from the countries he'd defeated and, and hordes of slaves back to Samarkand. And the result of is uh, still stands to this day. Uh, I, I took a, a, a quote from, from the book, actually, from, from the Central Asia book by uh, written by Kathleen Hopkirk. Architects, brick glaciers, ceramist tile makers, mosaic workers flowed in from Baghdad, Damascus, Shiraz, Isfahan, and Delhi, where one of Tamerlane's many wives brought cultural influences and skilled craftsmen from her native China. 
Whenever the emperor returned from a military expedition, he would immediately go and inspect the progress of his latest monument. And if anything displeased him, the architects would be publicly hanged in the marketplace. Thus was the Timurid style of architecture born. Um, and so, you know, these these places are, are, are completely mind blowing. But if you understand the historical, you know, the pain and suffering that, that went into to building them, essentially. Um, he Timur was uh, uh, a cripple. He was blind in one eye. He was horrendously ugly. Um, and this this is a, a statue. I think it's extremely flattering uh, of him. It's definitely not what he looked like. But some people have supposed that because he was so ugly and, and horrible, he wanted to leave something of, of, of beauty behind him in the world. This is the tomb of Tamerlane in, in Samarkand. Um, and there's a, an interesting curse on the tomb. <clears throat> so Soviet scientists um, opened Timur's tomb. Um, but there was a rumor that in Samarkand that opening the tomb, much like the ancient Egyptians, would curse anyone. And the tomb was actually inscribed with a warning saying, whoever disturbs my tomb, I will unleash an invader more terrible than I have ever been. Um, the Soviet um, architect which was called uh, Gerasimov, and uh, it was opened by him on the 20th of June, 1941. And... Two days later, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. So who knows? Maybe the curse of Tamerlane uh, really did take hold. A uh, few more pictures here. This is uh, images from Kiva, um, Bokhara. And it just, you know, it's 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 a sight worth seeing. I've seen the, um, the Uzbeki um, dancing women put on the most incredible shows um you could imagine and seeing them dance takes you back in time and you imagine what it was like traveling through with your with your caravan or an invading army and and stumbling across <clears throat> these cultures it's 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 lost nothing from from ancient times you can sort of feel the authority and i knew there was something i was gonna i forgot to say about pakistan and that was uh about the kalash tribe uh i showed you some pictures of them they are actually known to be either descendants or have taken on the Greek cultural heritage of the armies of Alexander the Great, uh, who passed through Pakistan. They are not Muslim, they're pagans. Um, and, you know, history in, in, in this part of the world is feels like yesterday. They still talk about uh, Sikander or, or Alexander to this day. Um, so, yeah, coming towards the end of, of the presentation, sorry, this was supposed to be half an hour, it's run on a little bit. We started way up in Mongolia. We've, we've, we've come down uh, past China, it through the foothill of the Himalayas. We come back up into Central Asia to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. And um, I'm just going to finish with uh, Iran or, or Persia. So we can't uh, run. It was our most pop one of our most popular destinations pre-pandemic. Um, uh, Biden did a very good uh, job of appeasing um, political tensions in the Middle East. Uh, Trump really kicked up a hornet's nest uh, when it comes to Iran by reimposing sanctions. The cost of medicine went up three times overnight, and anti-West sentiment became very strong again. And it's it's we we don't consider it currently uh, safe to go there, obviously hoping and praying that that, that would change as soon as possible. Because Iran, uh, Persia is, is just so central to the story of Central Asia um, that I couldn't, even though we can't go there at the moment, I couldn't fin finish the, the presentation without a short mention. It's decadent history of the Shah, it's ancient, um, history of his some pictures from groups in Persepolis, um, which was ransacked by Alexander the Great in uh, retribution for uh, the Persians uh, burning Athens to the ground a hundred years previously. Um, it's just got it all. Uh, there's a picture of me looking very English in a barber jacket with a GoPro. Um, and I won't talk about Persia a lot today, um, but I, I, I think I'll save that one for another time. 
Um, we've run over. Thank you very much for staying with me. Um, I definitely don't feel I've done this region uh, much justice, but I hope I've given you uh, at least, you know, a spirit of the flavor of Central Asia and the Silk Roads are a deeply exciting place to be. And there's so much from ancient times, which, which remains. Um, so I, I thank you for that. I can't see any questions uh, in the chat room. Um, so I'll probably leave it there for now. But thank you for joining us. Please do check out the Yellowwood Adventures website, yellowwoodadventures.com. And we look forward to welcoming you on some miraculous journeys in the future. Thank you so much. Oh.